Thank you uh, very much, Father Vigoa, for inviting me to speak. And uh, what an amazing audience uh, on a Wednesday night. Uh, I'm so, so grateful. Uh, you'll have to apologize for my voice. You know, during the day, I'm in trial all day. Then at night, almost every night, I'm, I'm doing this. And so I started to lose my voice. And the doctor said this morning, he said, you got to go two weeks of no talk at the end of the year. <laughs> Two weeks of total muteness. So my wife said, Doctor, that's the best Hanukkah present you could ever have given. <laughs> uh, I do want to thank my wife, too, for letting me be out every night uh, doing things like this. It's important. Uh, I've said before that in chambers, I, I make all the decisions, just like uh, my colleagues who are here do. But at home, I make no decisions. At home, uh, she's the boss. In fact, a few days ago, we went to a baseball game for one of my kids, and I gave her my phone so she could take some photos of my son. And uh, when I got the, when the game was over, I got my phone back, and, and I didn't really have occasion to call her for the whole weekend because we were together. But then on Monday, um, I'm looking through my phone. I cannot find her number anywhere. So I'm like, maybe I've got some kind of aneurysm going on. I got what's wrong with my brain? And I can't figure out her number. Then. One of my law clerks was leaving, so another law clerk took the phone, my phone, to take a photo of me with this law clerk and his going away. And as she's taking the phone, the, the phone starts to ring and she starts to shudder. Oh my God, Judge, the Supreme Court is calling. So I was like, oh, the Supreme Court, you know? <laughs> I was like, you know, which, which one do we think it is? So I just button my tie, I get it. I answer Supreme Court, and of course it was my wife. <laughs> She had changed the name for her in my phone to the Supreme Court, showing me who's boss. We, we, uh, we have a lot of material to get through, so I, I just want to, I want to get started by attacking really the principal contention that we see nowadays, especially on college campuses, about Israel. The number one contention in Israel, about Israel today on college campuses, what has attracted so many young people in America is that Israel is a, co a colonialist state, that Israel is the last manifestation of white colonialism in the world, and the view of college students in America and across the world sorry, is decolonization is an ugly thing. It requires a great deal of force. We've seen it for over a hundred years. Why would we expect this to be any different? That is the view. White colonialism and the example that people give is imagine, imagine people come from, from Ukraine and they move to Miami and they put a flag and they say, now we Ukrainians, we run Miami. It is our country now. And they speak their own language and they have their own religion and they have their own culture and their own race, and they're just totally different from us. They have never had anything in common with us, and now they just rule over us as foreign colonists with no relationship to the indigenous people of this country. That is the view of most people who oppose Israel, especially on college campuses today. And the good news is that view is absolutely and totally false. The fact of the matter is that Jews are the indigenous people of the land of Israel. Let me repeat that one more time. Jews are the indigenous people of the land of Israel. And we don't have to start 3,000 years ago in 1000 BC when the first temple was built. We can start with today's reading in the Bible. I followed along because Father Vigoa sent me the reading you all did today from the book of Daniel in 586 BC, over 2,500 years ago. A Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar II conquers Israel, the land of Israel. He destroys the first temple that Solomon had built in Jerusalem. And he takes all of the Jews into exile back to Babylonia. Babylonia is what today 
we know as Iraq. He takes them to Babylon. And in Babylon, in today's reading, Daniel, a prophet of Israel, the wisest of all the Jews in exile, gives advice to the son of Nebuchadnezzar, the new king of Babylon, Bezabel, or Bezabel, depending on the spelling. That's in today's reading. This is an aside that I don't talk about at other synagogues and schools where I have given this speech, but it must be said today, because we are in a place of worship, and because those of us who are sitting here know that this happened. That has always been the starting point of my comments about Israel. 586 BC, Jews in the land of Israel being taken to exile to Babylonia. I said to Father Vigo, I'd love to see what you're reading this week. He says, how about we send you what we're reading on Wednesday, the day that you're speaking at our church. And what is it that we're reading on Wednesday? We're reading the book of Daniel with the Jews in exile in Babylonia. Folks, we do not believe in coincidences. That is what you read today. So the Jews are in exile in Babylonia, and they're there for about 50 years until 538 BC when a Persian king, as Daniel predicts to Bezabel, Bezabel's dreams are interpreted by Daniel. Daniel tells him you will be conquered by the Medes. The Medes are the Persians. The Persian king Cyrus II conquers Babylonia and takes over with it Babylonia's possessions, one of which, of course, is the land of Israel and its capital, Jerusalem. But Cyrus doesn't like what Nebuchadnezzar and Bezabel had done with the Jews because, after all, Daniel had predicted that what he did to the Jews resulted in his downfall. And so he says, you know what, Jews? You don't have to stay with me here in Iran. You go forth to the land of Israel. You go home and rebuild your temple. And that is the beginning of a construction of the second temple that would last about 500 years, the construction of it. And we'll get to that soon enough. But the point is that in 538 BC, the Jews begin their return from exile to the land of Israel, and they live as vassals of the Persian king in Israel, with their capital in Jerusalem, with a high priest in the temple that they begin to construct in Jerusalem, with their own currency and their own laws and their own religious practices for over 200 years. Folks, this is a full 1,000 years before Muhammad was even born. This is a full 1,000 years before there was even such a thing as Islam. So in 538, the Jews go back to Israel. They rebuild their temple. They're there running their own kingdom for 200 years until in 330, a young man from Macedonia, Alexander the Great, comes, fights a giant battle against Darius, the king of the Persians, defeats his army in battle time and again, three different battles culminating in the great battle of Galgamela. Darius flees, his family and baggage train are confiscated, and all of Darius's possessions in the Middle East are conquered ultimately by Alexander and the Greeks, including, of course, the possession of Israel and Jerusalem. Now, Alexander, too, agreed with the Persians and said, let the Jews practice their religion. Let them govern themselves. But, of course, he dies mysteriously in India seven years later in 323 BC, and his kingdom gets divided amongst his four favorite generals. And the one we'll talk about here is Seleucid. Seleucid gets the choicest parts of the empire in the north. Ptolemy gets Egypt. Seleucid gets Syria, all of Greece, Turkey, Macedonia, and of course, as relevant today, Seleucid gets Israel. He gets the Jews. And Seleucid says, we're going to let the Jews run themselves. And the Jews formally run themselves with their own second temple and with their own currency and their own laws and their own religious practices in the land of Israel 
from 330 or 329 BC when Alexander gets there to 323 BC when Seleucid takes over. It's called the Seleucid Empire until about the 180s BC, things start to get a little hairy. The Greeks, they get a new king. The new king doesn't like this idea of the Jews running themselves. Plus, there's this problem of a civil war in Israel. He ends up getting his involved. His name is Antiochus IV. You know him because this was the reading you did just a couple of weeks ago. Just a couple of weeks ago, you read about Antiochus IV and the revolt that his clamp down on Jerusalem would lead to in 167 BC. And as soon as I tell you the name of the revolutionary, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So Antiochus puts his generals in charge of Jerusalem. He forbids certain practices at the temple. He doesn't allow the Jews to practice their religion freely. And slowly but surely, there is an unsettling in the Israeli countryside. And ultimately in 167 BC, a great leader from the town of Modi'in, folks, a town that any one of you can go visit in Israel today, that I have been to with my family on many occasions, a town that is as vibrant and Jewish today as it was in 167 BC, when Judah the Maccabee comes from the town of Modi'in and runs a rebellion that ultimately defeats the Seleucid Empire, and it takes a long time, in 140 BC, his descendants form a fully independent and Jewish kingdom. No longer do they have a sovereign, no longer are they vassals of a foreign kingdom. The Maccabees install the Hasmonean dynasty of Jewish kings, which lasts from 140 BC, at the end of the independence movement from Greece, until the Romans arrive with Pompey, Maximus Pompey the Great in 63 BC. So from 140 BC to 63 BC, the Jews have their own kingdom in Jerusalem and the land of Israel. That kingdom is fully sovereign with their own currency, their own laws, their own religious practices, their own temple, with their own high priests. Remember Benjamin Disraeli, the famous Jewish prime minister of the United Kingdom, when he was being heckled by a backbencher in the opposition once, one day. You know how they do it in English. They're so respectful to one another. He says, but they're really not, you know what I mean? He said, it's like when, a, it's when a, I see Paul Huck Jr. here. Paul Huck Sr., the dad, he had a famous thing. He said to the lawyers, don't say re with respect. I know it's without respect. <laughs> the lawyers always say with respect. Well, that's what Benjamin Disraeli did. A backbencher said to him, he was heckling him from the back. He was making fun of the fact that he was Jewish. And Disraeli looked at him and said, when the right honorable backbencher and his ancestors were mere cavemen in the hinterlands of the Roman Empire, my ancestors were high priests in the Temple of Solomon in the Kingdom of Hasmonea. Folks, this is an empire that Jews had built in the Jewish state of Israel with its capital in Jerusalem thousands of years ago. And it didn't just stop with the Romans. In 63, Pompey arrives, but you'll probably remember your history. He quickly gets beheaded and has other problems with Julius Caesar, who then gets into a fight with Mark Antony, and we get into the Roman Civil War. So they say, you know what? We're just too happy to have you Jews deal with your own problems and run your own kingdom. So from 63 BC, the Hasmoneans are allowed to govern themselves until 40 BC, 23 years. And in 40 BC, something amazing happens. The Jews had been governed at that time by descendants of the Hasmoneans. But the Hasmoneans had gotten to be too Roman, too Western, you might say. And there were people who didn't like it. So there was a civil war in a Jewish kingdom between Jewish armies. The Romans supported one side, the side of a young man from the Negev of Israel. For those of you who have been 
to Israel. We're going the entire length of the country on purpose. We've talked about Modiin and Jerusalem, which are in the center of Israel today. Now we're talking about the Negev, the southern part of Israel, which was still part of the Jewish land of Israel then. And this leader, his name is Herod the Great, the first great Jewish king of Israel since the old kings from the Bible, since David and Solomon. Herod wins the battle against his Jewish adversaries and forms a new Jewish capital with a new Jewish dynasty in Jerusalem and of course rebuilds the second temple in a bigger and bigger form, including of course building the western wall of that temple, the retaining wall, which we Jews still worship at today over 2,000 years later in Jerusalem. So Herod wins the war, he's king in Jerusalem of a sovereign Jewish state from 37 BC until he dies in 4 BC. And that is a very important year because most scholars believe, based on the writings of Luke especially, that Jesus Christ was born in the year of King Herod's death or shortly thereafter. He's born in 4 BC at this time. And of course, Jesus Christ is a Jewish man and a Jewish leader from the town of Nazareth. Nazareth, which is in the north of Israel. We've talked about the center of Israel. We've talked about the south of Israel. And now we're talking about the Galilee, the north of Israel, where Jesus Christ is from. He comes down from Nazareth after preaching in the Galilee region, after preaching in Tiberias and on the Kinneret, the Galilean Sea. And he comes down to Jerusalem. And of course, there he meets the Pharisees, the priests of the temple in Jerusalem, all Jews who have become corrupted by their Western influences. They have, all, they have Western names and Western practices, and they are not following the letter or the spirit of Jewish law. And he, of course, fights with the Pharisees. And that all plays out, of course, in the New Testament. But the point is, for today's purposes, that Jesus Christ was a Jewish leader in a Jewish state who came and, and disrupted the reality in a Jewish kingdom with a Jewish capital and a Jewish temple at a time of Jewish sovereignty in the Middle East 500 years before there was even such a concept as Islam in the Middle East. Folks, when you trace the footsteps of Jesus to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you are walking the footsteps of someone who would come from a Jewish land thousands of years ago, who himself was part of a broader culture and tribe which is indigenous to the land they now live in. But that's not the end of our story. Of course, in 66, King Nero, the emperor, nobody really likes Nero, and uh, the Jews didn't like Nero either. So it didn't work out so well. He clamped down on a lot of the Jewish practices, just like Antiochus had done for the Greeks a few hundred years before. And so there's a revolt in Judea. At first, the Jews win a few of the battles. They actually slaughter a whole legion in the north. Ultimately, Rome brings overwhelming force, and the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD by Titus, whose father is the emperor of Vespasian, and who would be emperor within a few years of all of Rome. There's a pocket of resistance, though. There's a pocket of resistance that survives for three more years, from 70 to 73 AD, and they get chased all through the southern desert by the Dead Sea, and they're killed, and they're attacked, and they're harassed, and finally, the Romans lay siege to them at a winter palace in the south of Israel by the Dead Sea, in the middle of the desert, on the very top, a couple hundred rebels with their families met their end. This is the winter palace of Masada, the winter palace that King Herod the Great himself had built in the 30s BC, a winter palace that anyone who goes to Israel should visit, that me and my family hike up every single time. We've been, in fact, it's kind of a joke in my family. If you look at like the portraits of Roy growing up, there's like Roy this big at Masada, Roy this big at Masada, Roy this big at Masada. Roy just keeps getting bigger 
Masada still stays the same size. <laughs> that is in 73 AD. The Romans then put a very serious clamp down on the Jews. And they rule the Jews with an iron fist for about 60 years. Until 130 AD, another Jewish leader comes, this time again from the north. Simon Bar Kokhba, Simon's son of the star, comes down from the north, leads a rebellion against the Romans, and wins against the Roman legions, builds his own kingdom in Jerusalem again that spans the length of the modern state of Israel and issues his own currency. Folks, you can go to the British Museum and see these coins. You can go to the Israel Museum and see these coins. There are hundreds of them. And I stop here for a moment to tell you about these coins because they're incredibly important. They're incredibly important because Yasser Arafat, fast forward a long time, Yasser Arafat, leader of the Palestinian movement in the 1960s, whose views were totally fringe 20 years ago, but are mainstream in college campuses in America today, Yasser Arafat wanted in 2000, he wanted President Clinton at the Camp David Accords to believe that these coins I'm about to tell you about are total falsifications. And President Clinton, through Dennis Ross, the interlocutor, said to Yasser Arafat, basically, do not say frivolous things when the President of the United States is in the room. That is what was told to this completely frivolous and fringe conspiracy theory 20 years ago, which now, through a bunch of propaganda on social media, has infiltrated the brains of our 18 and 20 year olds. And here's what the coins look like. The coins are amazing. On the front part of the coin, there is the facade of the second temple. The same temple that Herod had expanded, the same temple the Jews had reconstructed when Cyrus sent them back to the land of Israel in 538 BC, the same temple whose outer retaining wall, the western wall, we Jews still worship at today, 2,000 years later. And above the facade of the second temple was the Magen David, the Jewish star of Israel, which adorns even today the center of the flag of the Jewish state of Israel 2,000 years later. An unbelievable connection to our past, but that isn't all. On the obverse side of the coin, in Hebrew letters, remember the Ukrainian example, they come here with their own language, they have nothing to do with us. This is 2,000 years ago. In Hebrew letters, the same Hebrew letters that are used in Israel by the Jewish people today, there is a phrase around a lulav. The lulav is a branch that we Jews shake on the holiday of Sukkot to commemorate the exodus from Egypt. Around the lulav in Hebrew letters is written the phrase, in year one, for the redemption of Israel for the redemption of Israel, not Palestine, not Zion, not Judea, not even Jerusalem, for the redemption of a kingdom that had existed for thousands of years, even on that early date. And it's because of that coin that when the vote came down many years later in 1948, with David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel to decide, what will we call this redeemed and reconstituted Jewish state in the Middle East that they voted six to three over other options like Zion and Judea that they voted, let's call it Israel. Because that, because that was year one in the redemption of the new Jewish state of Israel in 1948. So of course then, over the course of hundreds of years, the Jewish state of Israel is conquered by one foreign army after another. It's conquered by the Byzantines after the Romans fall in the 400s. 
It's conquered after the Byzantines by the Rashiduns from Saudi Arabia. From the Rashiduns, it's conquered by the Abbasids from Damascus. From the Abbasids, it's conquered by the Umayyads from Baghdad. From the Umayyads, it's conquered by the Fatimids from Egypt. From the Fatimids, it's conquered by the Seljuks from Turkey. And then the Crusaders come, and they're there for 200 years until Saladin takes it. And then Saladin's descendants lose it to the Mamluks, also from Egypt, an amazing people, by the way. They were slave warriors who conquered the entire Middle East, Mamluks from Egypt. And the Mamluks are there until 1517. And in 1517, the Ottomans, an expanding and ultimately giant empire from Turkey, conquers all of the Middle East, including most of the Mamluks' possessions, and takes control of Israel and Jerusalem. And they're there for 400 years, from 1517 as foreign occupiers, from 1517 until they lose their empire at the end of World War I in 1918. Folks, during that entire time, the Romans, the Byzantines, and all of the foreign Arab and Turkish and Crusader empires the Jews were living in Israel, speaking Hebrew, practicing their religion as the indigenous people of the land, waiting for year one of the redemption of the land of Israel. In 1918, the British and the French decide, what are we going to do with all these people in the Middle East? And they said, we're going to split up the land. We're going to create mandates, they called it. Why mandates? Because, and this is the colonial talk of the time, we're going to mandate to them how to become civilized. They haven't ruled themselves in thousands of years. They need to learn from us about tea and right honorable and whatever else. So Israel and Transjordan, what's now Jordan, they become the mandates of Britain. That's the mandate of Palestine and the mandate of Jordan. And then Syria and Iraq become the mandates of France. And the idea was, we'll govern them for 30 years, we'll teach them how to do things, and then they'll become independent. And that's what happened. That's what happened. In 1947, England said, we're ready to give these people up. And they took it to a vote of the United Nations. And the United Nations voted 33 to 13, with countries as diverse as Russia and Haiti, and of course the United States, voting for a partition of the land in Israel. Most of it, about 80% of it or so, would be Arab land. And about, well, about 70% would be Arab land, about 30% would be Jewish land, partitioned in this way. Gaza, by the way, which we'll get to, was part of the Arab state. The territories that were attacked on October 7th, and we'll get to that, we're part of the Jewish land. 33 to 13, the combined nations of the world vote to partition the territory in that way. The mandate will expire. One year later, on May 15th, 1948, the Jews, they don't like it. They don't like it. They think they deserve the whole land. They think they're the indigenous people of the land. They've been there for thousands of years, but they say, you know what, we'll take it. We will compromise and we will take it. The Arabs reject the partition and on the day of the expiration, May 15th, 1948, all of the surrounding Arab countries invade, including, of course, Jordan and Egypt, and they lose that war. They lose that war and they lose a war in 1955, they lose a war in 1967, and of course they lose a war in 1973 during which each time Israel builds up more and more land. And we'll get to those war wars and their consequences in a second. But the point that I have established that you don't have to believe me about, just go to a museum and look, just read your Bible and look. The point that I've established that history has established is that Jews aren't colonists, that Jews aren't foreigners who have occupied this land, that Jews have always been there because Jews are indigenous 
to the land of Israel. The second claim that's made on college campuses today is that even if Jews are indigenous to the land, their government is illegitimate. That it was created in this kind of weird partition of 1948, 47, and the government is illegitimate. And I want to attack that contention too because it is absolutely false. In fact, I had a man tell me this at the gym in Coral Gables the other day. I was not happy. He was lucky I had just done so much bench press, I didn't have the strength. But here is, here is the fact. There are really three ways, folks, in which a nation, a people, can become a state. You can win it in a war, you can win the land in a war, and there are two kinds of wars. There are offensive wars, and those are a little bit less legitimate, you could probably agree. And then there are defensive wars of survival, unquestionably legitimate. Second, you can have a long presence in the, in the land, well established. Third, you can have a decree, just like you do in your home, a legal deed that says, I have a right to this land. Let's compare it, for example, to a nation we all agree is legitimate, the United States. Nobody would dispute the legitimacy of the United States. Let's address those three prongs of the American stool. We won our country in a war, war of independence, but let's face it, it was an offensive war. It was a war that we started. George III may not like him, but he'd rather not have fought that war. He'd rather have kept his colonies without a war. We started the war, so it's legitimate, but it's not like it's a war of survival, of defense. Second, we have a presence in the land, but it's not thousands of years. We came as Englishmen in 1607 at Jamestown in Virginia. Anyone who hasn't been should visit. They've got good, very good food actually, which is important to a 230 pound man. They're there in 1607. The chief of police is here. Well, we're all safe now, folks. They're in Virginia in 1607. But nobody considered themselves American back then. They were Englishmen. We were Englishmen. Nobody really considered, if you go to the literature, nobody really started to think of themselves as Americans, distinct from Englishmen, until a trial in Boston in 1761 where a lawyer, very famous lawyer at the time, who unfortunately died young and didn't become a hero of the revolution, James Otis, was the lawyer for uh, some of the petitioners there. John Adams and Samuel Adams were young men in the audience, very much moved by what James Otis was saying. It really was there that we started to think of ourselves as, you know what, we're different than they are, and they're not treating us right. And that leads, of course, 15 years later, to the separation. So, do we have a presence on the land? Yes. Is it thousands of years old? No. Are we indigenous to the land? No. Third, do we have a document? Oh, we have one of the greatest documents of all time. We have the Declaration of Independence. And it was decreed by and signed by, well, us ourselves. <laughs> we said it was written by Thomas Jefferson and it was edited by the other four members of the Committee on, of, of Style, John Adams, Ben Franklin, Roger Sermon, and Robert Livingston. Five men, all American, all patriots, all rebels, said, we're a new country. And we voted for it, and fait accompli. So, not exactly the same. Now let's compare that to the Jewish state of Israel. First, well before I get to that, I want to give an analogy. There is no doubt that Americans are legitimate sovereigns over the borders of our country. No one disputes it. It would be totally absurd for a Cherokee tribesman and his 2,000 buddies to go to Atlanta very early tomorrow morning and rape and behead 
1,200 people and murder in cold blood 1,200 people in Atlanta and say, hey, you're not legitimate here because you didn't have an international decree and all this other stuff. It would be absurd. It would be absurd for a Mexican national to cross the border to Arizona, to go to California, murder a bunch of people in San Diego and say, I was just reclaiming my ancestral land. That would be ridiculous because Americans are legitimate sovereigns over our country. There can be no dispute about that. Let's compare it to Israel. First prong, Israel want the land in war after war after war. 48, they won against six Arab armies. 55, they won against Egypt. 67, they won against Syria and Egypt. 73, they won against six Arab armies. 82, they won in southern Lebanon. Over and over, the Israelis have fought wars and won sovereignty over the land. And guess what? Every single one was a war of defense, a war of survival. Is it legitimate? It is unquestionably legitimate under international law. Second prong, Jews weren't in Israel for 15 years or 50 years or 100 years. We've already established Jews are indigenous to the land of Israel. Jews have been living and ruling in Israel for thousands of years, unquestionably legitimate. Third prong, Jews don't have just a document they voted on themselves. I mean, they have that. There is an Israeli Declaration of Independence. But they have an international decree voted upon in full convention by the combined nations of the world, recognizing the ancestral home of the Jewish people and voting to ratify year one in the redemption of the land of Israel. An incredibly legitimate claim to the land, in fact, as a historian, I have looked around the world to find another country whose claim to the land is more legitimate than the claims that the Jews have to the land they govern today, and I do not know of one. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but if it does, it is few and far between. Jews have an unquestionable legitimacy over the borders of the country they govern. Now, that's true of other countries in the Middle East. It's true of Jordan, it's true of Egypt, it's true of Turkey, it's true, of course, of Saudi Arabia. But that doesn't mean that we Americans need to concern ourselves with every aspect of Jordanian business or the survival of whatever regime happens to be running Egypt today, whether it's al-Sisi or someone else. That's not life or death for us. But it is with Israel, because Israel is the tip of the Western spear, because Israel is our closest ally in the Middle East, because Israel is a flourishing, vibrant Western democracy in the mold of the United States. Remember when Iran, and by the way, Hamas is not a Palestinian liberation movement. Hamas is an Iranian proxy terrorist organization. And remember that when Iran talks about Satan, Israel is only the little Satan. We are the great Satan. We are always conjoined with Israel because it is and always represents our values in the Middle East, which is why I remember this event so starkly. It was September 11th, 2001. I was living in New York City. I ran up to the top of my dorm building and I watched a giant black cloud of smoke against the bluest, crispest, cleanest sky you have ever seen. And on that day, 3,000 Americans were brutally and savagely killed in cold blood. Now you've seen on social media that some of these folks on college campus, they're revisiting Osama bin Laden. The same folks who are talking about 
the wonders of Hamas and the Palestine Liberation Movement are reconsidering us old adults view of Osama bin Laden as a terrorist. Maybe he wasn't so bad after all. Folks, I was there. And many of you were too. It was the most ruinous event of many of our lives, perhaps all of our lives. I remember distinctly going back to my dorm room that night with my roommates and watching in horror on TV as people on the Arab street danced with jubilation. The way they danced with jubilation in Times Square on October the 7th because of what had happened to Jews in Israel. But I also remember having gone to Israel shortly thereafter. And I distinctly remember that every, every flag, every flag in the country was put at half mast. A country thousands of miles from here, ostensibly nothing to do with Americans. They put all of their government flags by order at half mast. And almost all of the people I know in Israel had black drapes, drapes of mourning put out in front of their homes. Folks, Israel isn't just any country in the Middle East. Israel is our closest ally. That's why when there are surveys of pro or anti-American feelings of countries around the world, and by the way, we don't even do that well with the English, you know. <laughs> like, you know, they're, they're, we're so close, we speak the same language. They don't even really like us that much. Those of you who travel internationally, you go to Canada, you go to France, they think we're, you know, they think we're ostentatious and parochial and a little bit prosaic. They think we're arrogant and etc. But not Israel. Every survey that's ever been conducted puts Israel and a couple of other nation states, they're all, by the way, the former Soviet bloc countries, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, um, Estonia, and of course, the Czech Republic. These are the countries that love us the most. These are the countries that we should be devoted to the most. Israel more than any, because it's not in Europe like those other countries. It's in the middle of a danger zone, surrounded by rockets on all sides. It's not just Hamas. Hezbollah has 10 times the firepower of Hamas pointed at Israel, and they have nothing to do with Palestinians. Folks, they're not even Sunni. They're Shia, like Iran. This has nothing to do with Palestinian rights. It has everything to do with wiping Israel off the map. And to do so means to hit America where it hurts. Remember that we have skin in this game. We, as Americans, have skin in this game. Where Jews thrive, countries have always thrived. Where Jews are persecuted, countries are on their way out the window. Look at the Russia of Kishinev, the most famous pogrom of all, in 1903. 14 years later, it was gone. Look at the Germany of Kristallnacht in 1933. 12 years later, it was gone. Over and over again, the words of the book of Daniel that we read this morning, the words of the book of Daniel that we read this morning, you mistreat the Jews, Bezalel. You drink from their altar. You slaughter pigs in their temple. You are gone. Folks, not because I'm Jewish, but because I am an American. We have to identify and root out this latent and now extremist anti-Semitism whenever and wherever it appears. It is the moral rot inside of the wooden framework of our house that is eating away from the inside of our young people and our culture. Now there are three claims about the vibrancy of Israel democracy, Israeli democracy that I want to address right now. The first claim is that Israel is an apartheid state. Folks, nothing could be more offensive and further from the truth. Anyone who has ever been to Israel knows that Israel is the 
furthest thing from an apartheid state. Let's remember what an apartheid state is. Apartheid was South Africa from 49 to about 94. Apartheid comes from an Afrikaans word. It's actually a, fr a phrase. It's apartheid. It means separateness. Separateness. The first apartheid law in South Africa was an anti-miscegenation law. Whites and blacks could not marry. Whites and blacks could not marry. And then of course, all kinds of horrific laws. Blacks couldn't vote. They couldn't own businesses, get a license, drink from the same water fountains, use the same beaches, eat at the same restaurants. It was like Jim Crow in America, but on steroids. It was horrid and horrible. That is apartheid. Folks, Israel has a population of 9 million people and 21% of them, 21% of them, that's 8 percentage points more than Hispanics or blacks in America, are Muslim, Arab Israelis with full civil, commercial, and political rights. Full civil, commercial, and political rights. Let's discuss all three. Political rights. They have the right to vote. They have the right to hold office. They have the right to become judges if they want. In fact, there is a Muslim justice of the Supreme Court of Israel. There are 10 members of the Israeli Knesset who are Arab Israelis. Folks, apartheid, this is not. Civil rights, every Israeli, Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, gets a lawyer if you get arrested. You get all the due process that you would get in an English common law system. You could go to any restaurant, drink from any water fountain, use any beach, ride in any bus, train, or trolley car, irrespective of your religion. You can practice your religion freely. If you go to the town of Nazareth, of Nazareth, where Jesus Christ was born. It is 77,000 people, and 90% of them are Arab Israelis. If you've ever been to Nazareth, it is full of mosques with Arabs daily worshiping five times a day their own religion freely in the Jewish state of Israel. Folks, if this is apartheid, Jews are doing a real bad job of it. And then there are commercial rights. Any Arab, Israeli, can become a lawyer, a doctor, can have a license, become a truck driver, start his own business, his own clinic, buy property, lease property, become a tenant, anything you want on full and equal rights with any Jewish citizen. I'm going to tell you a story about that. When I was younger, my mom's best friend's husband was the head of building clinics for the Kupat Cholim, the Jewish healthcare, the Israeli healthcare system in the Negev, the south, where Herod the Great was from. And he would build these clinics in the Arab towns. That was his job. And he would take me. He would take me and my cousins down into the Negev, into the desert, and we would go into these Arab towns, Arab Israeli towns. And one day, he had completed a clinic. He was very proud. So we went to go see the clinic in Rafa. And in Rafa, we go into the town. And in the center of the town, there's this beautiful modern clinic, like any clinic you might go to in Coral Gables. And in the clinic, there were Arab patients, Arab nurses, and three doctors. One was a Russian Jew, just immigrated very halting Hebrew. The second was an Ethiopian Jew, black and fluent in Hebrew, born in Israel. Because remember, for all the claims that Zionism is racism, 5% of all Jews in Israel are black Ethiopian Jews with full commercial, civil, political rights who have fully been integrated into Israeli society from when they first came over in the 1980s and 90s. The third doctor was an Arab Israeli, Muslim, with perfect, flawless, accentless Hebrew. Every patient 
who would come to the doctor had a card. They would give the card to the nurse who would put it into a computer and all of the patient's medical history would come up on the computer. This is like 2006, folks. It's like, I don't even know if there was Facebook back then and the Israelis had already created a system we still don't have in the United States and they had built it for free for all their citizens. Every citizen in that clinic, because they are citizens, every Arab Israeli citizen in that clinic got to have an Israeli issued ID card which he or she would plug into an Israeli computer which would then pull up an Israeli database with all of that citizen's information with doctors and healthcare all fully 100% paid for by the Israeli Kupat Cholim folks apartheid this is not I'll tell you one more story about civil rights my dad and I, when I was in law school, we said, you know what, let's go see the Supreme Court. So we went to the Supreme Court to hear an argument. Not like the Supreme Court here. Over there, the Supreme Court, they sit in three judge panels. They never sit en banc, which is all together. And they don't have certiorari review. In other words, they don't get to pick and choose their cases like all our Supreme Court does. They have statutory review. So there's a bunch of cases that have to go to the Supreme Court. The one that day was a kind of case that by statute has to go to the Supreme Court. And that case is, if you are arrested for national security reasons, you're a terrorist, and you get your free Israeli lawyer, public defender, paid for by the state, you go to trial, and you ask the judge, like Judge Martinez here, you say, Judge, let me get some discovery. And the judge says to the government, give him over the discovery, tell him what you're going to prove against them. And the government says, ah, we can't. It's all secret because it's all from like the Mossad or whatever. You get an automatic appeal to the Supreme Court of Israel. So on that day, my dad and I go to the Supreme Court argument. And there are three justices. One is an Arab Israeli. In comes the defendant with the police. And there's a vibrant argument with his Israeli public defense lawyer fighting for a Hamas terrorist who had been taken from Europe, brought to Israel, wanted discovery, they were having an argument about it. At some point, they sent everybody out, which definitely doesn't happen at our Supreme Court. We all left, they locked the doors. I saw a young guy with a suit. I said, hey, you look like you know what's going on over here. What, what's going on over here? And he said, now's the part where they unveil what was behind the discovery because as I understood what was going on, the discovery the government had turned over to this defendant, it basically said, shalom, black, 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 you know? So there wasn't a lot there for him to build a defense on. Mr. Srebnik would not be happy with that. So in a closed door session, they unsealed the black and they talked about all the national security stuff and we came back in, they unsealed the courtroom and guess what? They ruled that he could get almost all of what he wanted. Folks, apartheid, this is not. The second claim about the vibrancy of Israel's democracy is that Gaza has been occupied. You've heard that all the time. They're just resisting, Hamas is resisting occupation. Folks, yet another completely false statement. Gaza was part of Egypt from 1948 to 1967. No one in Egypt thought, let's let them have their own country. That never happened. From 1948 to 1967, Gaza is just Egyptian land. In 1956, I told you there was a war with Egypt over the Suez Canal, and the United Nations, for the first time, put peacekeepers in Gaza in order to prevent incursions into Israeli land, same land that would be attacked on October the 7th. You've seen these people before. They're, they've got the blue helmets. You've seen them before. This is the first time they've ever been deployed in world history. We didn't know then what we know now, which is that UN peacekeepers are really bad at just one thing, and that is keeping peace. <laughs> and so in 1967, Gamal Abdel Nasser 
The Egyptian president says to the peacekeepers, you guys in your helmets, you look great, get out of here. And so the peacekeepers say, okay, and they leave. And he, of course, fights a war with Israel, which he loses. Israel takes over Gaza and a lot of Egypt, most of the Sinai, which they then trade away for peace with Egypt in 1978 as part of the Camp David Accords. By the way, the president who signed those accords for Egypt, Anwar Sadat, was then assassinated by his own people. Not relevant to our story. But point is that Israel does then occupy Gaza in 1967. They say, we've had enough. So they occupy Gaza for 38 years, from 1967 to 2005. And in 2005, something amazing happened, something you don't hear about in these college protests. In 2005, one of the great heroes of Israeli military history, Ariel Sharon, has become prime minister. He was the guy who encircled an incredibly bold maneuver in the 1973 war. The entire Egyptian Third Army in the Sinai Desert until they literally started to starve to death in the desert. And then Kissinger went to Israel and said, please don't let them all starve to death. Let's have a ceasefire. And Israel gave them a ceasefire. That's Ariel Sharon, a lion of Israel. He makes an incredibly controversial decision. In 2005, he decides Jews were out of Gaza forever. And he goes and he pulls out all the bases and he pulls out all the soldiers and he pulls out all of the 8,000 civilians and then he does something even more drastic. He gets the rabbis to go to the cemeteries and they disinter every Jewish body to say we are leaving this territory to you. And they took out, it was incredibly painful. To those people who were living in Israel at the time, it tore the country apart. Some of you maybe have seen videos of Jewish soldiers pulling Jewish men and women and children from their homes, kicking and screaming across the border. But Israel did it for the promise of peace. Israel did it for the promise that the Palestinians would build their own state in Gaza. One year later, Hamas overwhelmingly won the election in Gaza. One year after that, they had executed almost every Fatah member, the Palestinian Authority, which runs the West Bank, almost every Fatah member in Gaza. They do that, by the way, by throwing them off rooftops. You may have seen that. That's real. And they took complete control over Gaza. They haven't had a single election since. And October 7th, many people believe, is the direct result of the disengagement of 2005. Whatever else might be said, the claim that Israel occupies Gaza is 2000, since 2005 is completely and utterly and verifiably false. And remember one other thing about that. When people ask for a ceasefire, remind them that there was a ceasefire on October 6th and October 5th and October 4th, all the way back to 2005. The third false claim about Israel as a vibrant and flourishing democracy is that Jews have never wanted a Palestinian state. You hear that all the time. The claim is Jews in Israel are against two states. Folks, utterly and verifiably false. Put aside the 2005 disengagement which was an opportunity for Gazans to build their own state. Put that one aside for a moment. On five other occasions, Israel and the international community offered the Palestinians their own state. On five separate occasions, the Palestinians rejected it. In 1936, there was an Arab revolt against the British mandate before 47. In 36, the British sent the commission down, a guy named Peel. Peel ran the commission to investigate why had they revolted against us. He came back and told 
the British Prime Minister, it's interesting. There's two people, one land. They're not happy. So we need to fix it. They came up with an agreement that said, we'll split it 80% for the Arabs, 20% for the Jews. The Jews weren't happy. They thought they deserved all the land. But they accepted immediately on the spot, 20% of the land. The Arabs rejected it, that's time one. We've already talked about 1947, the partition. The Arabs rejected it, the Jews accepted it. They, they invaded and lost the war, that's time two. In 1967, I told you that story, after the peacekeepers are gone, the Six Day War is over, Israel goes to occupy Gaza and says, you know, we don't want this. So they said to Egypt, you take Gaza, and they said, Jordan, you take the West Bank and build a separate Palestinian state there, we'll offer it to you. We require only one condition, only one condition. Recognize our right to exist. And the Arab countries all got together in Khartoum in Sudan at the end of 67. And they came back with the infamous three no's. No peace with Israel, no ne negotiations with Israel, no recognition of Israel's right to exist. The third rejection. In 2000, we've already talked about it, Bill Clinton and Dennis Ross and Ehud Barak get together with Yasser Arafat at Camp David. They give, they make an initial offer, Arafat makes an initial offer. The Jews end up after 17 days and the Americans offering Yasser Arafat 98% of his initial offer. For those of you who are lawyers or mediators in the group, when your client asks for a billion dollars at the first offer at mediation, when does he ever get 980 million? Never. The Jews and the Americans said, you know what, have your own state. We'll give you 98% of your initial offer. President Clinton and Ehud Barak believed, even to the last day, that Arafat would accept. And of course, he came in on the last day and said no. Why? Because he didn't want two states. He wants one state. And we'll talk about what from the river to the sea really means later. He wants one state, an Arab state, with no Jews. So that's time four. And then time five was in 2008, another offer, 94% of Arafat's original offer, offered by the Jews with help from the Americans, also rejected. And then we've talked about 2005, the disengagement from Gaza. Five or six, depending upon how you count, separate offers from the international community to the Arabs to build your own country today with one condition, recognize Israel's right to exist. That has been a bridge too far. So we've established that Jews aren't colonists, that Jews are indigenous to the land of Israel, that in fact that if Jews do not belong in the land of Israel, they belong literally nowhere else. We've established second, that Jews have as or more legitimate claim to the borders that they govern than any other country in the world does. And third, we've established that it is a vibrant, flourishing democracy in the Middle East, the only Western, liberal, pro-American democracy of its kind anywhere in the region that deserves our respect and our alliance. So the last question we have to address tonight, folks, is the question about this war. The question about this war is a question under the law. The question about this war is a question of proportionality. Has Israel's response to the horrific attacks of October 7th been appropriate? Now I'll talk to you about the law in a moment. Before I do, I wanna make one thing crystal clear. The loss of one innocent civilian life is a tragedy. The life of one innocent civilian should never be put in jeopardy. And it is wrong whether it is a Christian life, a Jewish life, or a Muslim life. But that is not the question under international law. It cannot be the question under international law for two reasons. 
One, if it were, then no wars would ever be fought. Because every war that has ever been fought is a tragedy upon a tragedy upon a tragedy because wars of necessity, of necessity result in the death of innocent civilians. It's horrible. That's what war is. That's what war has always been. But second and more importantly, remember that Hamas has reverse engineered the laws of war. For those of you who know anything about video games, they have deployed the cheat code on international law. They have figured out our rules and they are using them against all of us. And here's what they've figured out. If I am bad, if I'm bad and I kill innocent Jews, then I will be killed. And I don't want that. But if I am really bad, if I am so bad that I commit double war crimes, I don't just kill innocent Jews, I then strap myself in Palestinian innocent lives, I embed myself in Palestinian civilian homes, and I use them to protect myself from Israeli reprisal, if I am that evil, then I can get away with it. Then it will be Israel's fault. Think about the consequences of that. If that's the way war is to be fought, if the person who is most evil gets away with it, then we as Western civilization will cease to exist. Because if we're the only ones playing by the rules, then the rules will swallow themselves. And that cannot be the law. We deal with this as lawyers sometimes. I'll give you an example. Imagine that you get defrauded and you hire a lawyer, a good lawyer, and you sue in civil court. And when you do that, you get to trial, you get to have depositions, you ask questions of their witnesses, and then you get a trial date from the judge and you get some justice one day, get some money back. But imagine if the defendant was not just your average fraudster, Imagine if the defendant was so bad that he wasn't just sued by you and your buddies in civil court, that he was so bad that he got the attention of the federal authorities and he gets indicted and he comes to federal court, criminal court. Now, the defense lawyers will say, when you as the small civil plaintiff say, hey, I want to have my money back, I want to have some depositions, they'll say, no, no, you can't depose anybody. They have a right against self-incrimination. They have a right to remain silent because they've got this pending criminal case. So they'll go to the judge and they'll say, stay the whole case for three years until the criminal case is over and then we'll figure out what happens with this poor guy's civil case. So what happens? Evidence gets lost, people forget, witnesses die, justice delayed, is justice denied? Judges are always careful about that. Judges want to make sure that we're not saying if you're bad, you have to pay, but if you're doubly bad, you get away with it. But that's what we're doing with Hamas. That's what we're doing with terrorist organizations around the world. We're saying, if you kill civilians, you will be punished. But if you kill civilians and then embed yourself with your own civilians as human shields, then you can get away with it. Because if the Israelis fight back, we'll stop them. We'll stop them from fighting back. So that's why we have to remember that the test is one of proportionality under international law. And the test of proportionality asks us to ask ourselves five questions. We've already answered two of them. And by the way, you're going to find that Israel has met all five, all five of these factors. First question. Is the government that's fighting back legitimate? Is it a legitimate government? Obviously, if it's Boko Haram, a rebel organization, and it's you know, blowing up some soldiers and it happens by accident to kill some civilians, we're not gonna cut it any slack. 
because no one elected you. You're not a legitimate sovereign. You shouldn't have been blowing up buildings in the first place. So are you a legitimate sovereign using legitimate military force? The Israelis we've already established unquestionably are. That's the first question. The second question we have to ask ourselves in this situation is, did you start it? Did you provoke it? Obviously, when Russia invades Ukraine, even if he kills civilians by accident, we're not willing to ignore it. We're not willing to give him any slack with it. We're not willing to say that's proportional because the war was unprovoked. It's his fault, so to speak. So those are the first two questions. And Israel, of course, meets both. It's a legitimate sovereign, unlike Boko Haram, for example. And it is responding to the most horrific attack against Jews on October 7th since the Holocaust. Unquestionably, a just war. So the first two factors go in favor of Israel. What about the next three? The third factor is very important. It grounds us. The third factor is, what is the evil we mean to eradicate? What is the wrong we are fighting against? Very important factor. Because of course, if, you're, if, you're a J, if, there's, if the evil you're eradicating is a jaywalker, well, you can't drop a 2,000 pound bomb from an F-16. That would be disproportionate. So the question is, on the other hand, if you're fighting against Nazi Germany or ISIS or Al-Qaeda, then a great deal more force would be proportionate. Folks, do not be misled about what October 7th was. There is now a 43-minute compilation video. I don't know if anybody has seen it. Probably not. Maybe Rabbi Fish has seen it. He's a bigger man than I am. It's an unbelievable video because I've read descriptions of what is on it. These videos are videos that Hamas themselves took. That's all it is. Hamas videos of Hamas atrocities. In the 43 minutes, the most commonly used three words repeated over and over and over again are Allah, Jew, and dog. Jew and dog are used interchangeably. <clears throat> A word that never once appears, Palestine. A word that never once appears, liberation. A word that never once appears, freedom. This was not about the liberation of innocent Palestinians. This was about the extermination of innocent Jews. I don't want to get too into the details because it's too much to utter. But you have seen the body of Shani Luke, a 23-year-old German-Israeli girl who was violently raped over and over and over again and violently murdered. And then she was dragged by a rope back to Gaza. And what happened in Gaza? Thousands of people lined up on the street as her body was dragged and mutilated and laughed and spit and beat on her dead body. A 23-year-old girl who was just at a party with her friends. There are two boys who go into a bunker with their father. They're holding the door for hours. A Hamas operative throws a grenade, kills the father. The boy loses one eye. His brother is dead. He comes out crying, bleeding from his lost eye. And all he keeps yelling is, my father is dead, why am I still alive? And the Hamas soldiers poke at him and laugh. There is the American girl, Abigail, four years old. She was released yesterday. Her parents cradled her 
cradled her. And Hamas videotaped themselves slaughtering her parents. She, covered in her, in her parents' blood, sprints across the street to her neighbor's house, where she's captured by Hamas operatives and held for 51 days in a hole, hundreds of feet beneath the ground. Remember the Hamas operative who had the Israeli public defender, who got the Israeli discovery? That is a terrorist who got a free lawyer and an appearance in front of Israeli justices and Israeli prosecutors were forced to hand over discovery to a terrorist. That's what we do in free and fair and Western democracies. Little Abigail, covered in her own blood, was held without a lawyer, without any justice, for 51 days in a hole by real-life monsters. And then there's Omar, who was released two days ago, or three days ago, whose family says he refuses to speak except for in the lowest whisper because he still thinks they're coming to get him. And like that, there are thousands of stories, thousands of stories, too horrible to even begin to recount to you. The stories of the rape of the women at the Nova Music Festival that the United Nations has still failed to condemn are unbelievable. There was a Herald article about it yesterday. I won't go into the details, read it. It is unbelievable what they did. And it was premeditated. In the materials of dead Hamas soldiers from October 7th, there are several phrases written down for them. One is the Hebrew phrase directed at a woman for take your pants off. Folks, rape is never about liberation. Rape is never about freedom. This had nothing to do with what the people on college campuses believe it to be. This is the Holocaust over and over again. And if you don't believe it, just listen to Hamas, his own spokesperson on Lebanese TV three weeks ago. He was asked, October 7th, why did you do it? He said, because the Jews were about to sign a deal with the Saudis. They were going to forget about us. We had to put ourselves back on the map. So he was asked, well, you took billions of dollars of aid from Europe and Iran, billions of dollars. You could have built Singapore. What did you do with all that money? Well, we built 300 miles of underground terror tunnels and an enormous arsenal of rockets and grenades and machine guns to kill the Jews. And he's, the reporter said, well, wh why didn't you build any bunkers for the, the civilians? Remember, in Israel, by law, every home must have a bunker because of the bombs that come in from Gaza and from the north. And he said, no, 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 the, sh the, the tunnels were for us, the Hamas fighters. We didn't want to build bunkers because we needed martyrs for our cause. And then the reporter said, well, do you regret it now that you've seen the horrors of the videos of what your soldiers did? He said, regret it. Regret it. We're going to do it over and over and over again until the Jews are wiped off the map. When we ask ourselves, what is the evil we are fighting against? This is no jaywalker. When we ask ourselves, is a response proportional to the complete extermination of all of the Jews in Israel? And by the way, it wasn't just Jews. On that 43 minute video, there is a Thai farm worker who is decapitated with a shovel. There were 15 Thai civilians killed and several Frenchmen and people from Vietnam and citizens from all over the world taken hostage. When we work against evil like that, much more forceful responses 
are proportional under the law. Think about, think about World War II. The Americans and the British killed over four million civilians in Germany. Americans killed over 200,000 civilians in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in a split second. Horrible. Horrible. As the Jewish grandson of Holocaust survivors, I don't want innocent German civilians killed, but it was necessary to effectuate the end of destroying an evil, genocidal regime. So too with Japan. And we do not question it nowadays. But we don't have to go back to ancient history. What about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? In Fallujah in 2004, four US contractors were killed, you'll remember, and their bodies mutilated. What did we do? The Marines surrounded Fallujah and for five weeks laid siege to the city totally lawful under international law and made it essentially uninhabitable thereafter. A totally proportional response. No one disputes that. We don't even have to go back that far. What about Mosul in 2012? It became the capital of ISIS. 90% of it completely destroyed by the Allies. Totally uninhabitable thereafter. ISIS was destroyed. That result was proportional. Nobody disputes that. Hamas is no different. The third factor favors Israel. The fourth factor is, what have you done to avoid the killing of innocent civilians? Israel waited for its ground invasion for four weeks to open a humanitarian corridor for Palestinian civilians to flee to the south. They sent hundreds of thousands of text messages and flyers warning Palestinian civilians to leave the north where the war was happening. At the Al-Shifa hospital, they brought fuel to the hospital and filmed themselves leaving it in front of the hospital at great risk and cost to Israeli soldiers, only to have the Hamas operatives in control of the hospital tell the director he wasn't allowed to go get it because it would make Israel look good. The German air chief, not reported in the New York Times, but the German air chief flew to Israel, met with the chief of the Israeli Air Force, went over their plans and what they had done, and came out and gave a remarkable speech. I highly recommend you read it. He said, I have reviewed their plans, and they are the most moral air force in the world. This isn't me saying it. This is the chief of the German Air Force. It's the most moral Air Force in the world, and he said one more thing. No one, no other army would have done more to protect innocent civilian lives in Gaza than what the Israelis have done. Last question, fifth question. What was your intention? Hamas, we know from the videos, it was murder, murder, and rape from the very beginning. In the law, we differentiate based on intention. We say if you murdered in a premeditated fashion, intentionally, well, that's first degree murder. You can get the death penalty. If it's manslaughter, you were drunk, let's say, you run somebody over, you get some jail time. But sometimes we kill people by accident as the collateral consequence of lawful activities. We're driving, we don't see somebody, we're careless, someone gets killed. It's horrible, it's horrible. But you don't get the death penalty, you don't go to prison, you may be sued, you may pay money. Intention matters in the law. We recognize that what is your intention matters, and it matters in the law of proportionality. What has been the intention of Israel from the beginning? Folks, Israel's intention is not to wipe Palestinian civilians off the map. Israel has nuclear weapons. Israel has nuclear weapons. Imagine if it were reversed. 
Imagine if Hamas had nuclear weapons and Israel did not. We wouldn't be here talking about that. The country would have ceased to exist many years ago. That is the intention we're talking about. Israel has done as the German air chief does, everything to avoid civilian casualties at the risk of their own soldiers' lives. The fifth factor weighs in favor of Israel. Folks, the war in Gaza is horrible. War is horrible. But make no mistake, under international law, the five questions that I've asked you, Israel meets every single one in a way that almost no other country in the world, maybe with the exception of us, the United States, has ever been able to accomplish. So I want to leave you with just one thought. There is this claim now that anti-Zionism isn't anti-Semitism. We don't hate Jews, people will say. We just hate Zionists. We don't hate Jews. We just hate the Jews who live in Israel. Never mind that that's half of the world's Jews. There's only 15 million of us in the world, and almost 8 million of us live in Israel. We don't agree with killing innocent babies and raping women over and over and over again and then beheading them. We don't agree with taking 10-month-old children hostage in holes. We don't agree with that. We just, we just kind of agree with it when it's the Jews who live in Israel. Folks, there is no distinction. Zionism is a simple and noble ideal. I want you to remember this, if nothing else. What is Zionism? Zionism is the recognition that for the last 2,000 years, we Jews have been agents of history. We have been acted upon. We have been played upon. We have been subjugated, humiliated, made into the other. And it started in schools. Ask my grandparents' generation, where did the Holocaust begin? It started in school. They stopped talking to me, and then they chanted at me, and then they humiliated me, and then they started beating me, because where did it come from? It came from what they were hearing at home. Nowadays, it's starting in the schools again, but it doesn't come from home. Nowadays, the parents find it odious. It comes from TikTok and social media. Who are their parents? It's China and Iran manipulating our children and grandchildren into the same evil ideology that rampaged the world in the 1930s. By the way, the connection is stark. Time and again, in Gaza, in the backpacks of dead Hamas soldiers. We saw a video the other day of dead Hamas soldiers. Israeli soldiers have been appalled to find one common thing one book other than the Quran. Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf. In dead Hamas terrorists, after dead Hamas terrorists, Hitler's hateful, genocidal ideology carried around on backpacks in marked up copies. So Zionism is the recognition and the idea that Jews will be agents of history no longer. That Jews will be an equal people among the nations of the earth. That Jews will be actors in history. That Jews will have the right and the obligation to stand up for themselves, to fight back if necessary with reprisals that are strong and forceful and which deter, just like any other nation in the world does. Kissinger told us that weakness is provocative.
Hezbollah, for all their talk, is not in this war with their 100,000 rockets and their Pledge of Allegiance to a common parent in Iran. Ask yourselves why. It's not because they love Jews. It's not because they think Albert Einstein was great. It's because in 2006 they attacked the north of Israel and they were made to pay. And in 2009 their leader Hassan Nasrallah said, had I to do it over again, I would never have done it. And if Jews refuse to fight back now against the horrors I have only begun to scratch the surface of tonight, against the greatest massacre of innocent Jews since the Holocaust, if we refuse to fight back now, that weakness will be provocative for decades to come. That is the end of Israel. So remember, folks, that when you hear people crying out for a ceasefire before the hostages have been released and before Hamas is destroyed, that what they are really saying is, you Jews, you Jews go back to the firing squads of Babi Yar. You Jews go back to the camps and go into the showers and turn on the shower heads and do not object. And what Zionism means, what the state of Israel stands for, is that we Jews, we will never go back to Babi Yar. We will never go back to the camps. We will never go back to Auschwitz and Dachau and Treblinka again because we Jews and we Americans, we do object. And that is the meaning of Zionism. Thank you all very much.